I can already tell this is going to be one of the most interesting interviews. <laughs> I know it. I know it. You're way too kind. And I know. I know. I, I, everyone. Tim, <laughs> Tim, tell, me, Tim <laughs> tell me what you're doing, and it sounds completely fascinating. So, uh -huh. I mean, people who are doing really innovative, bleeding edge uh, stuff, I mean, and have passion for it. I mean, what more can you ask for? That just makes the conversation just so easy. Oh, thanks, man. You're you're very kind. Hey, I'm going to use that as our jump in introduction. Thanks for being on, by the way. Of course. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, man, we're excited to have you. Tell Okay, so give us a broad overview of what exactly it is that you do and who you do it for and all of that. Sure. So I'm uh, Marco Palma. I'm a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M. And I'm also the director of the Human Behavior Lab. Uh, so in the lab, our mission is to really try to understand human behavior and do research to see how we can uh, use this information to uh, help people make better decisions to improve their health and their well-being and, uh, and everything in between. So we're, we concentrate on understanding the underlying motivations of what drives human decisions, what people say they're going to do, and what we actually do when <laughs> there is money or there is something on the line do not necessarily align. We all would like to save more money, to eat better, to, uh, to, to, to do a lot of things that are beneficial to us. We know that, uh, but it's very difficult to do. So we're trying to uh, uncover what are the, some of those drivers and how can we put this at the service of people so that we can make, uh, you know, hopefully better decisions in, in our lives. Hmm. Man, so you have you have some pretty interesting understanding of these things, right? So, you know, in in marketing, we always talk about nothing is real until money has changed hands. But uh, what do you see as some of those underlying motivations? So we study human behavior from many different dimensions. Uh, being in the uh, College of Ag, uh, uh, one of the things that we concentrate a lot is related to food choices and how that impacts our health, our nutrition and our propensity for chronic disease like diabetes and obesity. And so that's one of the domains that we're very much interested in, in looking at that relationship and the linkage between what we eat and our health outcomes. Oh. We are not trying to prescribe to people what they're supposed to do. We just wanna be able to do research that help them uh, achieve some goals that they want to have. Uh, and so from that dimension, we have some of that area that we work in terms of food and, and food choices, but the, uh, the other part of the lab is really related to any sort of human behavior from self-control to what drives people to cheat and lie to what drives people to give money to charity, uh, to, to see what, what makes us human beings competitive, particularly in labor markets. Um, and anything in between. And I think that my most interesting work has come in topics that I know very little about or almost nothing, because I think that we start from zero, building from the ground up and trying to, to understand and question absolutely everything from the foundation up. And so I think that for me, uh, having the flexibility of working on different domains is what keeps things interesting and fresh and it feels that I'm creating an impact, but at the same time that I'm learning something new every day. And so it's what keeps it exciting and, and new and fresh all the time. Hmm. Okay, so I have a related question here. So um, speaking about human behavior and specifically our awareness about what drives us and that sort of self-reflective uh, ability, how, how often can people fully articulate or even get close in the articulation as to core motivators, why it is that they're doing, and then does it, does it betray what you can actually tell um, in the quantitative research and the numbers? And it's like, no, no, you told me story A, and what the research shows is story B. Is that a constant thing across all of the kind of research you find? We're just not very self-aware. Uh, I think that we are uh, sometimes, obviously, there is this literature that is pretty interesting about self-serving biases or self-persuasion, where we believe something that is compatible with our views, and we hold it to be true because uh, we want to keep a good image of ourselves. 
And so in many cases, for example, we've, we had some experiments where, uh, you know, people can contribute to a charitable foundation, and then we give individuals an incentive to be more selfish, to keep more money. Uh, and then in this situation, for example, in this experiment, we had an intermediary that was either going to take a low or a high commission. And we asked people, hey, what do you think is the proportion of people that are going to take the high commission? And when we had the incentive to be more selfish, we believed or we rationalized that there was a larger proportion of people that were going to take the high commission. And hence, it's okay for me to keep more money. You see, it's not about me. It's these other guys that are going to uh, take the high commission. And this is why I'm, I'm giving less. It's not because I'm selfish. It's because others are affecting what I do. And so that element is, is pretty interesting. There's a pretty cool paper, somebody that came to uh, A&M not too long ago and, and show that um, participants in international debate teams, after being randomly assigned their position in a debate, uh, they're much more likely to support and believe that's the right position. And so it, 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 it's almost like in a quest to try to convince others that we're right, we automatically try to convince ourselves that that's the right position. And we use the information around us to make sure that we keep that self image. And so that's an interesting uh, part of the self persuasion, but I think it's a little bit more general than that. If you think about, I know what's good. I know that I should be saving more money. I know that I should be exercising a little bit more. I know that I should be eating a little healthier, but it's difficult to do. And the issue is that, you know, th there is these this, um, motivations that we can keep for a while. Th take, for example, um, New Year's resolutions. It's mm -hmm. something that we all have to go through. But by February 1st, 80% of Americans, we give up on New Year's resolutions. Right. So we started asking this question, why? And when we started looking at these models of self-control, which is why do we do not necessarily do the things that we know are good for us, and, and there were two big models that explain this type of behavior. And I, I, I don't know about you guys, uh, but let me know if you identify with the, any of these two models. All uh, right. The first one says, self-control is like a snowball. So when I'm good, my snowball starts to get bigger and bigger, and I'm more likely to exercise self-control because I feel more motivated. And the more I try to do it, the bigger the snowball, and the more likely I am to exercise self-control in the future. I think you can kind of, 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 of relate to that. The problem is on the other hand, the other model states, oh no, 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 wait a minute. Self-control is like a cell phone battery that when you start you know, a full day's rest, you, you slept well, you, you're fully rested, you have your, your batteries full, but then going through the day, you start to you know, exhaust your battery resources and then you're less likely to exercise self-control. So you see how the big problem is, you know, one states it's supposed to go up, the other one states it's supposed to go down. And so when we started looking at this, we said there has to be something missing here. And, and what we found was that there was a variable missing in terms of compliance. You know, some of these experiments ask people to exercise an initial act of self-control. But the issue is that if you ask me, for example, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big coffee drinkers. If you ask me to exercise self-control by reducing the number of coffee cups that I get in the day, well, I'm activating some sort of self control. But if you ask a non-coffee drinker to do the same, there's no activation of that initial act of self control. So you didn't give an opportunity for that snowball to start. Um, and so what we found in the research was when we set up to find out which of these two is correct with opposite predictions, we found that they're both absolutely correct. In fact, the self control model is almost like an inverted U shape where if you do it well, that snowball activates and it increases. But if you overdo it, then you're, you're operating in that region where your uh, self-control is already exhausted and you're less likely to continue exercising self-control. So going, going back to our New Year's resolution, typically we go from zero exercise to going to the gym for an hour. And so we go from zero to 200 miles an hour. And so, it's almost like we're setting up our, ourselves to fail because we go from nothing and we go to the point that it's too much for us. And so we need to find out what's the balance of things that I can get some small victory, something that I can taste some success and keep myself motivated to achieve uh, those goals. So I think that's probably the key in terms of trying to uncover the relationship between 
keeping my motivation level, keeping my engagement, and so that I can continue to try to uh, exercise my self-control and keep motivated. I absolutely find myself in both of those models. Um, like I, I can hear both of them and say, yep, that fits me very well. How about yourself? Do you find yourself in both? Yes, I do. And, and, and I think it depends on the type of, of situation. Uh, sometimes for some things, uh, it, it might be easier for me to operate in the portion of, of self-control that, that keeps me engaged and motivated, but there might be some other things that are more difficult. And so if we, if we think about eating, for example, not everyone has the same taste and preferences for the same foods. So while it might be easier for somebody to give up soft drinks, that might be totally very difficult for somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. And so the key is not following a prescribed notion of what is going to be good for me. I mean, we are the person that knows us the best. And so we can say, hey, here are some potential gains I can get because it's easy for me to give up and, and I can keep these up for a very long time. Even, you know, I wouldn't mind, for example, not eating certain foods for the rest of my life. It wouldn't be a big deal for me to do, but there are things that I cannot give up. And so try to find out what are the things that we may experience on a personal level? Uh, what are the things that I can experience myself that would be easy for me to, to get those gains? And if you want to reduce the number of calories, that might be the easy way to do. Give up the things that you know you can give up that are not very costly to you. And so that's, that's a good way to keep your, your level of motivation. Obviously, this applies for other uh, domains in our lives when it comes to exercising, uh, it comes to quit smoking, reducing alcohol consumption, uh, being nice to other people, not running people in traffic in the morning, uh, which has been actually pretty nice around town lately. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I could see that applying to a ton of different areas, financial health to, you know, saving and not spending and and all of those things that we just find difficult because it is self-discipline. But but I have I have another question though because you know, from a brand and marketing strategy, I I know that we have to look at the person holistically and you guys run the behavior lab and so i know analytics and data and it begins to tell a story you're able to be able to to put a story together but you're also you're you're acknowledging that we tell ourselves stories in our own heads right and so it may be that the analytics the logic component of what your lab is able to produce that that's going to make an impact for some people and they're going to go ah yeah i know but the the studies show and so it's their 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 hyper rational mind will be able to take what you guys are turning out but you're also having to impact look emotionally there's all of these other components how do you how do you put both of those things into play oh i think that's a fantastic question and so uh just to give you a little a little overview of some of the type of devices that we have here in the lab. We have state-of-the-art technology that, that, that allow us to, for example, uh, trace the visual gaze of participants. So we know, for example, if they're looking at something, it's, it's possible because if they care about that type of information, whether it's in an experiment on a computer or whether it's in a, in a different type of more realistic real-world environment. Uh, their pupil size increases uh, as we get excited when we look at something that we the like eyeballs. or scared. Yeah, either one, you know, positive or negative emotions dilate our pupils. And unless you've been trained by the CIA, <laughs> some special forces, you know, most of us cannot really fake that, that pupil size increase. Um, obviously, it also primarily deals with changes in lighting and, and, and some of these other things. So when we run these experiments, we want to be able to control for those patterns in which we might, for example, say, hey, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you get it right, I'm gonna pay you $1, versus if you get it right, I'm gonna pay you $20. So here, whatever the question is, there's no change in the contrast in the light or anything else. The only difference is that the stakes are much higher in one of the conditions versus the others. Okay. And so this is, for example, an interesting way to, uh, to understand behavior, choking under pressure. Why is it that we can perform, and as the stakes get larger, we increase performance, but there is a point at which, hey, you know, you're so, all of a sudden you're in the World Series. It's not the same level of pressure that if you're practicing, you know, or playing with your kids in the backyard. And so 
these things matter a lot and the environment in which we're in making those decisions the, the people who we're with in the social context matters and it changes the way in which we make um, decisions. And so in addition to these eye tracking, we can also track um, facial expressions. So we know how individuals are reacting emotionally by, uh, by what they're seeing. Uh, we can track their brain activity, particularly in the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex to see what are some of the motivations that are driving that engagement. Um, mm -hmm. We can do these in a computer, we can do this in, in uh, virtual reality environments with eye tracking. Uh, more recently, we have uh, uh, brain stimulation devices and we can exogenously stimulate certain parts of the brain to see how that may moderate behavior. Most of that work right now is being done with motor functions, which means you know, to control, for example, conditions like Parkinson's disease or something that, that, that changes our motor function. But now we're starting to use these devices to see how economic behavior and social behaviors might be moderated by this brain activity. And that's the, the start of something that we're really opening the door to look at that causality of what's really driving the decision in different parts of the brain and how does context influence uh, that decisions that we make. And so I think it's an integral part of understanding the human behavior because we're affected by what happens to us. You know, think about going to a restaurant and we haven't been in a in restaurants for a while so we're starting to go back to normal it's fantastic most restaurants are pretty full but if you're in a city that you're not familiar with and you drive to a restaurant and you see that the parking lot is completely empty what will you do will you guys just stop there or keep driving gotta keep going oh yeah you don't mess with that see, right <laughs> and so this is an example of how even without any sort of verbal communication what other people do influences what we do. Ultimately, our decisions are influenced by others, even when they don't say anything, just by the mere fact of doing and taking some, some actions. So these devices allow us to really understand different motivations and different types of consumers. So you were talking, Mark, about uh, marketing. And, and in marketing, for example, sometimes I get asked, how do we develop the perfect product? And this applies to how do you uh, help somebody who wants to lose weight? How do you help somebody who wants to save more money to eat better? Right. There's no one recipe that works for everybody. And so I'm, I'm going to use the example in marketing. If you want to develop the perfect hot sauce, okay, and you want to survey, you know, what do Texans like or what people in different uh, places might like in terms of how hot do they want the hot sauce? If we go by the law of averages, suppose that you have individuals like, you know, so that, that, that like their hot sauce pretty mild. And then you have people like me that likes it very, very hot. So if you go by the law of averages, you're gonna go somewhere in the middle and then you're gonna make a lot of people unhappy mm -hmm. because there's no such thing as that perfect hot sauce that, that satisfies everyone. In this case, you might have two different types of consumers. You might have three and you need to identify what drives the, the taste, what drives the behavior of those different types of individuals. So this is what we try to do in the lab is to discover what are the different types of individuals because they might be responding to different stimuli. They might be responding to different things in terms of changing their behavior. And that's what these devices are pretty useful for is to help us understand things that even us, we might not necessarily know why we do what we do, but these devices are picking up a lot of uh, physiology of how we respond and that's helping us to paint a picture and to put a full picture of not only the outcomes but what got us to those outcomes and what are some of the behavioral motivations behind them hmm. this is this is a, a uh, fascinating and uh, very specifically applicable field of research how is uh, how is it and, and how is it going uh, as you're trying to gain funding and as you're trying to gain support? How does that work for you? So, you know, I think that the most important resource that we have at the lab is people. And we are very uh, lucky in that we have collaborators, partners all across campus. And I think the most fascinating thing that we have is that we brought together people from different colleges and just by by sharing stories by sharing expert by sharing information 
I think that we're um, actually becoming a lot better in our understanding from a holistic and a complete point of view of human behavior. And yes, our interaction with other humans, but also our interaction with intelligent machines, which is probably gonna become a big issue uh, or a bigger issue in the near future. Future. So for me, uh, you know, everything started with a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Dr. Ruiz Rivera and Dr. Charlie Hall. You know, we, uh, we were concentrated on the mathematical models that would predict things, but we didn't necessarily have a good understanding of why. And so we started looking at these devices as they started to come out and we said, hey, we need to, to buy some of these devices so we can really understand what's driving the behavior. And we said, let's give us two years of a deadline to get the money to be able to buy one unit that has all of these things that we can use. I think that two weeks later, we had enough money to, fu to fund Amazing. the first unit. Uh, and you know, a couple of years later, we, we uh, had enough funding from the university system, several of the university agencies that came together to, uh, to fund this lab. And that was at the time the largest uh, human behavior lab that measures neurophysiological responses in the world. Uh, today, we're still the largest academic lab in the world, uh, but there are others from private companies that are slightly larger in terms of the number of eye tracking devices. Um, but our dream is to, to bring together the latest technology with uh, people and resources, expertise, to be able to collect data at an unprecedented scale. So the, the first experiments, like the self-control experiment I was talking to you about, I think it took us about three and a half months to run that particular experiment. Mm -hmm. Today, we could do the same experiment in about three days. So that increases the data collection capacity. But more importantly, you know, we have 16 units here in the lab. We can also understand a strategic behavior or people interacting with others and see how they cooperate, how they compete, how they cheat and get money from each other. I mean, all of these things that are allowed by virtue of, of having people do things interactively with other human beings or with computers or so on. And so I think that's the, the real value in terms of what, what the lab brings together. And so I want this enterprise to be open for anybody who's interested in human behavior, um, in particular in the domain of, of of how do we behave as humans, not as individuals, but maybe in groups or, or in settings in which we're influenced by others. Well, I want to say that, you know, the, the particular field of study, um, the, the, the value proposition and what, what this type of research is, is proposing to understand and, and the, 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 the way in which our world works and the way we make decisions is is extremely valuable and very interesting and also uh your own personal passion is absolutely coming through as you speak about it it's no surprise to me that uh, people want in and to be helpful it's no surprise to me that funding and uh the support that you're finding is behind you because it's just an, an amazing recipe of um, value and, and passion and where that mixes. So I, I gotta say, I, I have enjoyed talking to you and, and I really think that this is going to be some amazing work that you're doing. Well, don't, don't wrap it up too, too early. I have one last question. <laughs> yeah. So, so, PS. <laughs> uh, uh, my, my question is, is in all the projects that you guys have undertaken and whether that's the neuro waves, whether that's, you know, whatever it is, um, because I know that your mission is connected to human flourishing and the ways that we're improving quality of life, we're improving um, populations, uh, you know, that are facing certain kinds of struggles. Of all the projects that you guys have worked on, what is, what is the one that you are most proud of because you think that it made the most, you know, impact in real people's lives? Well, th that is a great question, and and it's 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 simple, but at the same time, it's very difficult to answer. I I think that the most important thing that we do here in the lab, the one thing that makes me wake up in the morning, to um, to be excited about what we do, and and it doesn't really feel like I'm working actually. You know, it's I'm so lucky that they pay me to yeah. play in this lab. You know, and and to me, it doesn't really feel like work. Um, but 
the, 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 the motto of the lab, which is my life's motto, is dream big, work hard, help others. <laughs> I love that. You see that plaster in our cobs and, and, and in everything that we have around here in the lab. I tell people, my students in particular, if people are not laughing at your dreams, it means that they're not high enough. People should think that you're absolutely crazy in your dreams. But here's the, here's the issue. When you're dreaming, you're typically sleeping. And so you need to wake up every day and work hard towards achieving those dreams. And then lastly, if you do this because of your own hubris, then it's very easy to give up. You know, it's easy to right. give up in ourselves. But when you're doing it because you want to help others, you cannot fail them. And so I think that's the recipe that for me has given me a lot of enthusiasm. And I've been able to find equally minded individuals who share the same vision and the same passion. And that has been fundamental for no, our for our work. And while we might not necessarily have the same strengths, we complement each other very well. Hmm. So if you ask me what is the best product um, that we put together, I'll tell you without hesitation, it's our students. I mean, that's what we are looking to. There's only me, there's only one Charlie, there's only one Luis, but as we continue to work on, you know, and, and try to challenge the next generation of researchers, it's amazing to see them now, they're spreading all around the US and spreading all around the world, starting their own labs, and so the, the impact that they can create is, is really multiplied by everything that we do. And so I think that as we continue to grow, I am looking forward to looking at the contributions of my students. And it's so nice to see that their students are starting to do wonderful work that is creating a lot of impact. So I think it's about developing that passion for doing something uh, that, that is going to try to help others and, and, and putting that at the service of Texans and people around the world. Because as academics, I think that sometimes we fail in that last step where we do great research. I mean, Texas A&M, if you look at the amount of research, it's almost a billion dollars that is spent on research uh, on campus across the system. And it's a lot of wonderful information. And I think the last step of putting together something that tells the general public why should I care about this? How can I use it? And how do I benefit without necessarily having a lot of math or anything else in the middle? I think that's, that's, that's the part that I really enjoy doing. And as a land grant institution, it is our mission to also support uh, the general public, to support industry in their efforts to improve products, to improve services, to make people's lives easier, better, and longer. And so that's what I really enjoy about and seeing these, these kids grow and becoming almost like my own kids in a way, you know, professionally right. speaking and, and seeing them succeed, that's what makes this completely worth it. Oh, man, well, that's, that's powerful. That's a good answer. So it's not one project, it's all of these people that are being trained and being deployed out there to make, you know, multiplied impact. That's, that's pretty neat. Well, all right, I'll wrap it up then. Thank you very much for uh, being on. It was wonderful and we learned a lot and all the best to you. Hey, Martin, thank you very much for the invitation and, and let me uh, extend an open invitation for you guys. I know that you've been here to take pictures, but you're welcome to come back. And if somebody who's hearing uh, is interested in learning a little bit more about the lab, we invite you to take a look at the work that we do. If you're dreaming of an experiment, of an idea and do not, work, do not know or are not sure where to start, get in touch with us and we're always happy and excited to talk about experiments. Uh, we do that every day here in the lab. I do it at home with my own kids. And so experimenting is my life. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, wishing you the best, guys. And we appreciate the opportunity. And Absolutely. Marco, please, please, please keep doing the work you're doing. That is good kind of work. All right. Thank All right. Sir. Thanks, Marco. Thank